Hey everybody, before we get started, I want to let you know that Cole and I have once again partnered with FreeCE so that you, the listeners, can claim ACPE, Accredited Continuing Education, for the episode you're about to listen to. Listeners will have the opportunity to claim one hour of at-home continuing education credit by visiting the link that it will be in the show notes. For FreeCE members, this service is going to be included in your membership benefits at no additional cost to you. Simply follow the link that we give you and you will have a post test and evaluation for this activity use the password blood pressure all caps one word to unlock the post test for this episode for those of you who are not currently a free ce member we definitely invite you to explore all of the benefits of their unlimited membership that they have on their platform free ce offers hundreds of live webinars on-demand webcasts home study monographs accredited core consult rx podcast as you well know and now offering pharmacy news with ce simply put free ce has all of your ce needs covered from now until august 31st 2021 core consult rx listeners can receive 15% off the purchase of an unlimited membership by entering the discount code CCRX at checkout or by clicking the following link that will be in the show notes. I hope you guys enjoy. Thanks. What's going on, podcasting listeners? We are back with another episode that is accredited as far as continuing education for your pharmacist or nursing license coming at you right now. <laughs> Cole, what's up, man? Doing good. How about you? Good, good. So we've we've done hypertension in the past. We've mm -hmm. done multiple like kind of case reports and things like that, but one, we haven't done any that have been actually accredited, and it's been a while since we like truly like went through just hypertension by itself with all the different medication options yep. and things like that. Yeah, I think the last one we did was on the Kodigo guidelines, and that was just one small snippet. So we're going to do a good, robust uh, overview of hypertension, top to bottom. Top to bottom. You're going to know where to start your patients on what, and where to get them fifth, sixth line, you know, down the line. Yes. And believe it or not, this is actually the first topic that we ever did when we started this podcast in 2018. Was it really? Yeah, hypertension. Wow. The new uh, when the new guidelines had come out fairly recently, Look we at did that. the uh, American Heart Association guidelines. The Full 2017. Circle. Full circle. So here we are, back at it. So this is where we'll retire. This will be the last episode ever, <laughs> and we'll go from here. Not really. Yeah, hopefully not. But um, we'll kind of go over some basic review, and then, like Cole said, we'll get into the drugs and the like you know, the pharmacotherapy and as far as when to pick what agent and how to start which agents and all that good stuff. So hopefully this will be beneficial. Even if it is review, then, you know, review is always good. And so. we're going to try to hit some, um, some details that you might not hear all the time and might be a reminder, but, um, also good to know. So we'll start with, so hypertension is of course, high blood pressure. Blood pressure is broken down in between the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. Top number would be systolic. That's what patients will hear it as. Bottom number, diastolic. Um, systolic is uh, when the um, heart is contracting, and diastolic is when the heart is filling, which lasts longer than the um, systolic phase, which makes sense. If you're sitting there and your heart's filling, it's going to take longer than if your heart is forcefully contracting blood out of the heart. And we won't go into too much as far as the uh, physiological components of it, but one thing I do want you to remember is the mathematical definition, if you will, of blood pressure, which is blood pressure equals cardiac output, which if you remember is uh, cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So cardiac output times either, you'll see it abbreviated a couple of different ways, either TPR, which is total peripheral resistance, or sometimes you'll see SVR, um, the uh, systemic vascular resistance basically means the same thing. It's that constriction and um, resistance kind of in the periphery. And so uh, cardiac output times total peripheral resistance equals blood pressure. So that'll come into play whenever we kind of go through um, some of the medications like blood, uh, like beta blockers and whatnot. And when we talk about some tricks for dosing and when to take medications, there's also the phenomenon of dippers versus non-dippers, which we've talked about before. But essentially, blood pressure fluctuations follow kind of a natural circadian rhythm. 
your blood pressure is going to be higher during the day. And for the majority of people, it dips or it, it um, decreases at night while you're sleeping and then starts to kind of uh, increase more with, uh, you know, in the morning prior to awakening and that sort of thing. But for some people, your blood pressure does not dip at night. It stays elevated. Um, so when we go talk about a few trials as far as dosing blood pressure medicines at night or like keeping one of them um, at night, the reason is to try to hit uh, a patient who might be a non-dipper uh, where their blood pressure does not naturally decrease while they're sleeping. So one of the processes that is really important to kind of regulating blood pressure and one of those processes that can kind of go kind of haywire and what can lead to hypertension is the RAS system. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or RAAS. Um, and what ends up happening is basically angiotensinogen is um, – convert into angiotensin 1 by the enzyme renin, um, which is released via, um, it's secreted from the uh, juxta, uh, juxtaglomerular cells based on various components. It could be um, different um, sodium concentrations. It can be like when the, when their blood pressure is starting to go low, you can start getting renin secretion to sort of increase that blood pressure and maintain homeostasis. The problem is when that system is is not responding properly, you get this increase in angiotensin 1 um, as a direct result of renin being released, and then angiotensin converting enzyme then changes that to angiotensin 2, and that angiotensin 2 is responsible for various mechanisms throughout the the body. So it impacts vascular smooth muscle, which can lead to vasoconstriction, uh, increase in total peripheral resistance. Mm -hmm. Um, It can affect the heart and increase contractility and increase cardiac output, which also will increase blood pressure. Um, And then there's other things at play, like the... um, peripheral nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, which can eventually lead to total peripheral resistance being increased as well. Um, The CNS can also uh, sort of signal vasopressin to be released, which increases blood volume, which again increases total peripheral resistance to increase blood pressure. Um, The intestines, kidneys play a role as far as the sodium and water reabsorption. Um, That can increase the blood volume and lead to blood pressure being increased. The adrenal cortex can increase aldosterone synthesis, which then leads to more sodium water absorption and more blood volume. And so there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms at play. But the uh, the the RAS system is kind of at the center of, of a lot of that um, pathophysiology behind hypertension. And so you'll see when we start talking about the various uh, medications we have, a lot of them will affect that RAS system directly. Yeah, the scientists are clever. They make drugs that attack the... Uh the system that increases your blood pressure. Very clever. Very clever. And, and Mike talked about the mathematical definition, the cardiac output and the total peripheral resistance. So there are things that can, let's say, increase cardiac output. He mentioned the RAS system. The RAS system can do that um, if it's stimulated by vasoconstriction, like he said. Um, uh, venous constriction can also happen because um, of sympathetic nervous system overactivity. Uh, you can also have cardia- increased cardiac preload from increased fluid volume from either incre- uh, excess sodium intake, exogenous sodium, um, or renal sodium retention. And total peripheral resistance can be increased um, by uh, having a functional vascular constriction few, uh, via a few various ways. Excess stimulation of the RAS system can do that. Sympathetic nervous system overactivity can do that. You can have genetic alterations of cell membranes, um, endothelial derived factors, all of those can cause functional vascular constriction. I mean, you can also have structural vascular hypertrophy via the RAS system or increased sympathetic nervous system activity, also through genetic alterations of membranes and endothelial derived factors. Uh, you can also have hyperinsulinemia resulting in metabolic syndrome, and that can cause structural vascular hypertrophy as well. All of these can increase uh, peripheral resistance, and those together are going to bump up your blood pressure. One of the reasons why uncontrolled diabetes tends to go hand in hand with um, blood pressure and or hypertension. So, as far as kind of some other background information, you know, the ASCVD risk calculator. Uh, if you saw our dyslipidemia episode, um, you kind of we went through the ASCVD risk calculator, the ten-year um, risk. Um, risk estimator plus that um, is available in the app store and on various websites Um, that's going to be important to kind of dictate which uh, how many medications or if we need it to start a medication versus lifestyle management when we're first uh, establishing someone with a diagnosis of hypertension so we'll come back to that but um, if you 
watch that or listen to that episode, make sure that uh, you've downloaded that calculator because you're going to need it when we go through the algorithm. You're gonna, you better have it out and ready to go. Ready to go. Um, and most of what we talk about as far as recommendations are going to be based on those ACC AHA guidelines that we talked about. Just FYI that there are other guidelines out there. I reference Kodigo for kidney disease. Um, there's diabetes guidelines that reference blood pressure. There's also kind of a straight blood pressure guideline. Um, the most updated one is JNC-8. Um, there were, of course, JNC-7 and various ones before. Um, it's out there. There are people who use it. Um, you know, We'll leave it up to your opinion as to which uh, you prefer because the the recommendations are slightly different. Um this is America. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Of course, we have our own opinions as well. Um, but in just in general with JNC8, because we won't talk about it too much, is um, for their recommendations for kind of the regular person under 60 years old is a goal blood pressure less than 140 over 90, um, where ACC AHA is less than 130 over 80 generally. Um, over 60, it's 150 over 90. And then kind of other recommendations with various blood pressure or diabetes issues and that sort of thing still less than 140 over 90 is kind of their their standard number that uh, they recommend and, uh, and that's and even in older patients the uh the aha guidelines tend to still target lower doses um whereas gnc like cole said is a lot more lenient um the reason for kind of the difference in in blood pressure goals is the uh, american heart association guidelines came out after the sprint trial was completed so if you're not familiar with Sprint, uh, it was a multi-center, open-label, randomized controlled trial that basically included patients um, that were with, they did not have a history of diabetes um, and did not have a stroke or elevated cardiovascular, um, or they had could potentially have a stroke or elevated cardiovascular, but did not have diabetes. Um, and uh, with the intensive group in there on they were shooting for a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 and then a standard uh, blood pressure group in that study there was 135 to 139 and the primary composite outcome they were looking for was the first occurrence of either mi acute coronary syndrome um, stroke heart failure or cardiovascular mortality um, the results basically were that the intensive uh, targeted uh, systolic blood pressure of less than 20 group did have better outcomes overall had um, significantly different in uh, that primary composite also cardiovascular mortality all-cause mortality and um, you know so it kind of led us down the path of looking at more intensive goals now they didn't quite make the goal blood pressure at the end of the study less than 120 they gave a little bit of leniency so they said less than 130 over 80 so that we could hopefully kind of maintain some of those effects that you get from lowering the blood pressure to a more intensive target, but also reduce the rate of adverse effects from having to use multiple agents and things like that. Right. So at the end of that study, uh, that's when the American Heart Association guidelines released their updated um, guidelines that were in conflict with JNC-8. And so that's where the, the difference really originated from. But and I'm... They- yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and, you know, they, Cole and I do tend to go with the more um, stricter guidelines. However, obviously, if the patient can't tolerate it or they're having issues with adverse effects, then, you know, being more relaxed is not the end of the world. And you'll still get some benefit if you get 140 over 90 in certain cases. Right. And I've talked to a lot of clinicians who want to be more lenient, understandably, if you're the one prescribing the medication, um, their concerns are increased side effects, low blood pressure, you know, passing out, falls, especially notably patients, all that sort of thing. Viable, viable, uh, definitely reasonable concerns. Um, also, they might say, you know, based on one trial, we don't want to necessarily change practice this significantly. There's also other critiques of the sprint trial um, about how specifically um, they um, measured blood pressure. There was a, a very strict protocol about that, and they used a, a, automa- a specific automatic blood pressure cuff um, in a very controlled setting, that sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, there's there's arguments both ways. We just feel like the the data is compelling for um, the more the more strict control, especially in patients who are secondary prevention of ASCVD risk, which is kind of what the ACCHA guideline recommends. Um, they say if they have had an event um, or their ASCVD risk is greater than 10%, then definitely the level of evidence is high for targeting less than 130 over 80. Whereas for you know a regular person without increased risk factors, you know the evidence isn't as great that they're going to see you know really good benefit with going for less than 130 over 80. So if you're having a lot of trouble getting them there, maybe not as important. 
Um, but still, they, they still make the recommendation with a lower level of evidence for that. And, and I actually misspoke earlier. I said that it excluded patients with diabetes, but included patients with stroke. That's false. Um, stroke was also an exclusion criteria for it. So sorry about that. Um, as I said it, I was like, I feel like that's wrong. Live corrections. <laughs> Live that's, corrections. That's how we do it. Yep, for sure. Um, so yeah, diabetes or stroke was an exclusion, and then they basically had to have some form of limited uh, cardiovascular risk um, or in the heart failure or anything like that was an exclusion. So they were looking for those specific results. Um, but it was an important trial. Yes. And so as far as like the staging of hypertension, they also changed that up a little bit as well. So they said that normal blood pressure is a systolic um, of less than 120 uh, and, and and is important and less than 80 diastolic. They said if it's your blood pressure is elevated, it can be 120 to 129 and less than 80 diastolic. Uh, and so you don't get actually get to stage one hypertension until either the systolic is 130 to 139 or your diastolic is 80 to 89. So if you have a patient whose systolic is, you know, 125, let's say, but their diastolic is 85, then that is going to automatically bump them up to stage one because the diastolic is, is elevated in that 80 to 89 range. So it's and for the normal and elevated, so systolic and diastolic, you have to have and for both of those. And then it's or, um, systolic or the diastolic um, criteria for stage one and stage two. So stage two is basically anything greater than one, 140 or greater, or uh, systolic or greater than, um, or equal to, or greater than 90 diastolic. And I think some, some concern that clinicians will have is when they hear a goal of less than 130 over 80 they're like wow you know you know i have a patient who bumps up to 132 over you know 78 or whatever i don't necessarily want to start them on amlodipine or something like that and so that's not necessarily the case even though once they have established blood pressure their goal is less than 130 over 80 you don't necessarily have to treat somebody if their blood pressure pops up into that range um so what the guideline recommends for a compelling indication for starting medic uh, pharmacotherapy right now is less greater than 140 over 90 which would be that automatic stage two um, if they're in the 130 to 140 range systolic 80 to 89 diastolic um, then you can kind of assess them if they've had if they've had clinical ASCVD diabetes CKD their ASCVD risk is over 10 percent um, that would be more of a indication to start a um, blood pressure medicine then whereas anyone else who doesn't fall into that lifestyle modifications and reassess until they bump up past uh, 140 over 90. Yeah. So even stage one hypertension, we do not necessarily need to treat every single patient. They have to have those other clinical risk factors like Cole said. And the thinking is they're just not going to get as much benefit from a drug if they don't have those other risk factors. And, and the other important factor of that is making sure you're doing the blood pressure measurement correctly. Right. Because, you know, in Sprint, they had that very elaborate system that the clinician would leave the room. The patient would kind of use their own ambulatory, you know, blood pressure monitoring system that they had set up in the room um, without the presence of the clinician so that they could kind of hopefully eliminate Waco hypertension. And so all that's going to be important. And, and you'll see that as well when you have a patient that comes in and the nurse or MA or whoever immediately checks their blood pressure tends to go up um, more than it actually is than compared to when they sit there for a little bit. The whole um, clinician leaving the room thing for the white coat hypertension is kind of funny. It's like you're just pretending like you're, I'm not even here. I can just see them walking out the door and just closing and sitting there waiting a few minutes and then popping back in like, okay, I'm here again. Did you check it? <laughs> um, the other thing is the non-pharmacological. We won't go into too much detail about this, but just to kind of give you an example of how this, the non-pharmacological treatment options and lifestyle modifications can impact blood pressure. Um, for example, with weight loss. So a patient... Um, gets approximately one millimeter um, of mercury reduction in their bl blood pressure per one kilogram of weight loss. So, I mean, that that right there, you know, if you have someone who's obese or, you know, over overweight, um, that can hopefully encourage them to kind of lose some weight and hopefully reduce their need for multiple medications and things like that, depending on what their blood pressure is, or at least give them some hope of getting off some of these medications. Um, 
the DASH diet can lower the systolic blood pressure by as much as 11 mil, um, points in, on the blood pressure scale of millimeters of mercury. Um, physical activity, so we're talking like 90 to 150 minutes per week of aerobic or dynamic resistance training, can um, lower the, especially on aerobic, can lower 5 to 8 millimeters of mercury off the systolic blood pressure and then 4 with dynamic resistance. So when you start adding all those things together, you're getting huge reductions in blood pressure without even touching a medication first. Right. I mean, so, 20 points with just lifestyle modification. Yeah, I mean, that would it's be, a ton. That would be incredible. Yeah. So just because someone has even stage two hypertension does not mean that they necessarily have to jump right to uh, medication and, and or stay on medication long term. Right. Um, the other thing I will mention real quick too is if a patient um, is stage two and you know is in, kind of indicated for starting therapy, um, if the goal blood pressure is greater than 20 systolic or 10 diastolic millimeters of mercury away from whatever their goal blood pressure is, 130 over 80, let's say, then um, using a combination of two drugs is strongly preferred by the, the newer guidelines. So, you know, whether that's an ACE calcium channel blocker or ACE thiazide, whatever the case may be, um, they do recommend using that uh, a combo medication so you can kind of come at it from two different mechanisms, um, especially while you're titrating the drug up. So keep that in mind. Um, that may be harder to get the patient to kind of agree to, but it is preferred to do two drugs if the if they're further away from goal. All right. All right. Talk background about some information meds. complete. You've done it. That's all. There's no more background information Zero. for hypertension. <laughs> we covered all of it. So um, we'll go through some of the meds, and I guess we'll start off with our friend, the ACE inhibitors. Sure. So we have various ACE inhibitors that are still in the market. We have benazapril, enalapril, lisinopril, quinapril, ramapril, parenopril, um, captopril. It just goes on and on. Um, most of you are familiar with the, at least a few of those uh, and maybe utilize a few of those in practice. Uh, they have various dosing regimens, so we won't go into much of that. But they, these are going to be considered one first-line option um, for most patients with hypertension. Um, I will say they they don't seem to be as effective uh, based on data from the all hat trial in patients um, in, in our African-American patient population as some other first line options like calcium channel blockers. But um, for the majority of patients, the uh, ACE inhibitors are going to be kind of considered a, a first line option. You'll, you'll see as we move through this, there's three different first line potential options. And um, these are inhibiting the that angiotensin converting enzyme that's responsible for that conversion of angiotensin one to two, uh, and so if we are blocking that, we're kind of inhibiting that RAS system from you know activating all the other stuff down downstream like aldosterone and whatnot, and so we're getting a reduction in um, in blood pressure. Adverse effects, we would expect hypotension to be one concern. Um, the other one is that's kind of a big deal to kind of pay attention to is acute kidney injury. Uh, it can also cause hyperkalemia. Um, it can induce this kind of dry, hacky, chronic cough. And angioedema is also another risk factor for ACE inhibitors as well. Um, <clears throat> as far as, you know, looking out for an acute renal injury, um, we are taking the patient's baseline serum creatinine, and we expect it to increase slightly, so 15 to 20% maybe, but 30% or more is indicative of a AKI or acute kidney injury. And so that's when we would have to discontinue the ACE, you know, rehydrate the patient and kind of figure out what else is, is going on and potentially rechallenge it again after the patient's been kind of stabilized. But um, it, there's no set serum creatinine baseline. It's just whatever that patient's serum creatinine baseline is, um, we're looking for a 30% or more increase. And if we see that, then, then we, we know we need to stop because they could have, have, have a kidney injury. Um, and then as far as potassium, basically if their potassium at baseline is 5.5 or less, then we can go ahead and start the ACE inhibitor. So even though that risk of the potassium increasing from that, that point, we're, we're just kind of monitoring for hyperkalemia. We're not worried about, you know, pushing it that far up. Um, but if a patient's 5.6 or higher, then we, we need to get the potassium down before we start an ACE inhibitor. Yep. 
Um, got to kind of pay attention to some other meds that can also increase potassium, like uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, for example, or like our aldosterone antagonists, our spironolactone and aplerinone, which do have potassium sparing properties. Um, antibiotics like uh, Bactrim, um, sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim. Trimethoprim component can increase potassium levels. So we got to be cautious with that and, um, you know, make sure we're taking that into account. But other than that, pretty simple to kind of start a patient on an ACE inhibitor and go from there. Yeah, for sure. And another thing we think of ACEs as being apart from just decreasing blood pressure is to have some sort of renal protective effect. Somehow they can um, benefit the kidneys in some way, especially in patients whose kidneys um, are not completely healthy. Um, so one example of that is uh, one study from New England Journal of Medicine from 2006 looking at benazapril. Uh, versus placebo in patients with severe CKD. It was only a few hundred patients. Uh, they had elevated serum creatinins between 1.5 and 5, and they were given benazapril 10 milligrams twice a day versus placebo, and they um, did see a statistically significant decrease in serum creatinine uh, doubling in stage renal disease uh, and death with a number needed to treat of 5. Yeah. It's pretty great. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people get worried about when they see a serum creatinine, especially something as high as five. I mean, that's end stage, almost to the point of end stage renal disease in a lot of patients. But in this, in this case, you know, these patients had severe CKD. And even in that case, you know, we still started the patients on benazapril. And as long as they didn't have a 30% increase from that baseline of five, then we knew we could keep them on it. And they still ended up having um, blood pressure lowering and renal protection as well with a pretty low number needed to treat. Yeah. So don't don't let a high serum creatinine deter you. It's just 30% from that patient's baseline. There's no like cutoff as far as starting the that baseline. Right. Um, one other thing that we've started to kind of recommend over the last few years uh, with probably the most commonly used ACE, lisinopril, uh, is usually it's given once daily, uh, but it has a half-life that's not quite 24 hours, more like 12 hours uh, as far as the half-life goes, maybe the duration of action a little bit longer. Um, so there was a study from 2017 um, that showed that you could get better blood pressure lowering if you dose lisinopril twice daily. Um, so that's kind of a, a nice little clinical pearl, I guess, if you're trying to, maybe you don't want to add on another med, but you need a few extra points of blood pressure reduction, splitting that to twice daily. Um, if that's what they're, if they're currently on once daily, might get you a few extra points uh, with the patient. Yeah. And that's something that I will often try to do to kind of op optimize the, uh, the patient's, you know, medication that they're on before adding on other different, you know, meds or going third, fourth, fifth line agents. Um, the, the study from 2017 that, um, looked at twice versus once daily dosing um, resulted in a 10 millimeter mercury difference in systolic blood pressure. So that's Pretty good. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, ARBs. So we have lots of different options there too. Candesartan, Herbisartan, Losartan, Telmosartan, Valsartan, et cetera. Um, those are going to be similar to ACEs. We kind of think of those two as kind of like cousins, like lumped together. So we pick one or the other when we're picking our first line agents. Um, these block the RAS system a little bit further down. So they're actually blocking the um, angiotensin um, receptor. And uh, they're so they're not blocking that enzyme that's converting it, but actually blocking the receptor that it binds to. And so um, it's blocking a little bit, a little bit different. Um, and so adverse effects are going to be pretty similar to uh, ACE inhibitors, with the exception of the risk of angioedema or that dry chronic cough. Um, those are more so from that ACE inhibition where we are blocking the breakdown of things like bradykinin, um, and especially like there's a lot of ACE, uh, that enzyme available in the lungs. And so you start getting this buildup of bradykinin, which leads to the cough or a buildup of bradykinin systemically, which can lead to angioedema. And so um, the ARB is blocking a little bit different spot. And so we're still getting the ACE kind of allowing to, or allowing ACE rather to break down that bradykinin and, and not lead to that increase of angioedema and that cough. So a lot of times if you have a patient on an ACE inhibitor, they're doing well on it, but they're having that chronic cough, switch them to an ARB, it'll go away. And, and I've worked with it. clinicians who might even consider the ARBs first line versus ACEs for that reason, who don't even want to deal with, you know, the cough and having to switch them to a different medication or whatnot. And they'll go straight to ARB. Mm -hmm. But yeah, your decision. It's, it's, um, it's not an uncommon, uh, uh, issue to have, but they'll, they'll consider ARBs and ACEs effectively therapeutically equivalent, even though we have a little more data with ACEs, um, and they'll just go straight to ARBs. 
And uh, one thing, you know, there's been some studies that have looked at um, ACEs and ARBs, kind of comparing the two. And for the most part, there's not really any difference seen between cardiovascular event reduction. Um, However, I will say we've mentioned this in other podcast episodes, but the combo is not is no good. We want to stay away from that. It's not going to provide any additional benefit in most cases and really just increases the number needed harm as far as side effects and whatnot. Um, so like, for example, on target, which compared ramipril to telmosartan, um, using the combo provided no additional benefit and led to a dropout due to side effects of number needed harm of 30 patients. So you utilize the other agents before uh, trying to use ARBs and ACEs put together. But right. yeah, like Cole said, it's, it's kind of one or the other, and a lot of people are now moving towards ARBs. And and I kind of use that same thought process with lisinopril, where you're dosing it every 12 hours with some of the um, ARBs as well. So for example, like Valsartan, you know, if you look at the package, it'll say to dose it once a day for hypertension, but then twice a day for heart failure, which is most of the outcome studies, if not all of the outcome studies with Valsartan is looking at it twice a day. So in the, and the half-life is definitely not 24 hours, it's much shorter, um, 12 hours or less. And so I tend to dose even the, the ARBs like that twice a day as well, just to kind of maximize the kinetic profile of them. Yep. Um, there's also, if you want another trial looking at ARBs, they did compare um, Valsartan to amlodipine, um, looking at first cardiovascular events and patients with hypertension and additional cardiovascular risk factors and didn't find a difference. Um, looking at the secondary outcomes, they did find a slight increased risk of MI with Valsartan versus amlodipine uh, with a number needed to harm of 143. Um, so yeah, that's just ARBs, ARBs and amlodipine. That's called the value trial. Yeah. Thiazides? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so thiazides, uh, we've got our handy dandy hydrochlorothiazide. <laughs> Um, these are diuretics. Uh, we've got orthiazide like diuretics. We've got chlorthalidone, indapamide, um, the three you've probably heard of, and then also metolazone as well. Um, these are going to inhibit sodium and chloride reabsorption, uh, specifically in the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron in the kidney. Um, some notes about these they're usually not effective below 30 millimeters per minute uh, creatinine clearance. So if your um, kidneys do go too low, then they're probably just not going to work as well. Um, they can cause all sorts of electrolyte uh, disturbances, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypercalcemia, and hyperuricemia, also hyperglycemia, though the uh, rates in which those occur between the drugs is different. Um, in general, since they're diuretics, you want to dose them in the morning um, because it can cause nocturnal diuresis, uh, which actually can become better over the course of a number of weeks. Um uh, but there's uh, some reasons why we might choose one over the other, which we've addressed in other podcasts before. Um, you know, considering hydrochlorothiazide does not have quite the data that chlorthalidone and endapamide do, and this most updated ACCHA guideline recognizes that um, and, and references chlorthalidone uh, throughout, though endapamide is a reasonable alternative as well. Um, and there's various reasons for that. Some of it's just straight from outcome data, some of that's from pharmacokinetic. Uh, data like their half-life so hydrochlorothiazide by far has the shortest half-life somewhere between 6 to 15 hours whereas chlorthalidones is pretty long about 40 to 60 hours and endapamide is a little bit shorter 14 to 24 hours um, and the durations of actions uh, reflect that so hydrochlorothiazides can be less than 24 hours even though it's dosed once daily um, and kind of, kind of for that reason that's probably part of the reason why we don't see the the outcome data that we uh, want to with hydrochlorothiazide versus the others. The, and, and Cole, you mentioned the electrolyte abnormalities being different amongst the classes too. I, I think this is, for me anyways, like a huge important factor when kind of differentiating between the thiazide and thiazide likes. So for example, potassium, one of the big arguments against chlorthalidone is even though there's a lot of data that backs up, it's, you know, um, ability to lower um, cardiovascular events or the risk of cardiovascular events and whatnot. Um, Hyperkalemia or excuse me, hypokalemia is a big risk. Um, And we do know that that has the highest risk of um, causing hypokalemia compared to the other two agents. But indapamide actually has the lowest risk. So indapamide also has outcome data. It's been studied in patients all the way up to 100 years old in the high vet trial. And so um, it has the lowest instance of causing um, hypokalemia. 
it also has kind of a neutral profile when it comes to glucose reabsorption. So the other two agents will increase glucose, re- glucose reabsorption. And for me, since I do a lot of work with diabetes patients, one of the areas where I kind of always think about this potential interaction is with SGLT2 inhibitors. So if I give someone with diabetes um, in like Jardians, for example, and it blocks the glucose reabsorption at the proximal convoluted tubule, pushes more glucose to the nephron, and then all of a sudden it gets to the distal convoluted tubule where the thigh Sides are working, and then you get reabsorption of glucose there, you've kind of taken away some of the effectiveness of the SGLT2 inhibitor. Whereas in dapamide, it's actually kind of a neutral effect on glucose. So you don't really have to worry about that as much, um, whereas clothalidone and hydrochlorothiazide, you do. Um, it also has um, neutral effects on like serum lipids, whereas hydrochlorothiazide actually can increase your lipid panel. Um, and then there's kind of mixed data with clothalidone in that regard. And then when it comes to renal function, so we've, we've already mentioned that less than 30 um, millimeters per minute creatinine clearance, we tend to not want to use a thiazide. It's kind of like a general overview, except with endapamide, it actually is approved down to 10 mils per minute. And uh, there was a study in the American Journal of Nephrology that compared endapamide versus HTTZ in patients with CKD. And at the end of the study, the uh, patients that were in the endapamide group ended up having um, an average of 28.5% increase in their creatinine clearance versus hydrochlorothiazide, which continued to decline. Um, their creatinine clearance continued to decline by as much as 174 um uh, points on the their cre- or mils per minute, and um, so it's almost got like this nephroprotective um, ability with endapamide as well. Um, not to mention the fact that you're going to get better blood pressure lowering with endapamide, and uh, it kind of goes endapamide is greater than clothalidone is greater than HCTZ, and so you know you endapamide in my personal opinion is kind of like the way to go with thiazide or thiazide like diuretics because it's just covering you know it's got the least amount of worry when it comes to the electrolyte profile it's got the kidney protection it's got um the glue the neutral effects on glucose and, and the most blood pressure lowering numerically so um I, that tends to be the one that i personally go with and um most of my patients, if I'm consulting or whatever. Yeah, the um, ACCAHA doesn't mention it as much. They they kind of mention clothalidone, but I think the Cadigo guidelines mentioned it a few times where other guidelines have just kind of, you know, usually mentioned thiazides as a class or specifically, you know, it's, it's usually, le- it's the forgotten the forgotten winner, I think. And, and as far as cost too, that's the big question I always get asked is, well, is it expensive? Is that why it's forgotten? It's on the $4 list at Walmart and it's relatively cheap. So it's not, that shouldn't be. And the more it's prescribed, the cheaper it gets. Yes. So I wouldn't worry about the cost of it. You'll have barely get access to it. It's easy to dose once true once a day bed. So yeah. go with in depth of mind. But clothalidone has some, some data as well, like from the SHEP trial, um, seeing cardiovascular benefits of clothalidone. Uh, which were kind of lost if the potassium fell too low, below 3.5. So with chlorthalidone, they kind of shoot for a potassium of 4 to 5. Um, but Mike mentioned the HIVET trial, which uh, was in dapamide. In those older patient populations, um, it has some calcium channel blocker-like properties. Um, no renal dose adjustment, like Mike said. So yeah, a lot of benefits. Yeah. The other thing is in dapamide was added to parandipril in the PROGRESS trial um, for patients who had had a stroke, and uh, it decreased the rate of, uh, or the risk of secondary stroke compared yep. to the parandipril by itself. So that's where we get that ACE plus yep. thiazide, thiazide recommendation. So good good option all around, in my opinion, definitely my go-to thiazide-like diuretic, which leads us to our potassium-sparing diuretics. Yes. We have our true potassium sparing diuretics, which are things like amylaride or triamterene. Um, those are also available in combination with HCTZ. Uh, unfortunately, they use the lamest of all the thiazides. But, um, Most combos for, with thiazides. Yeah, unfortunately. I can only think of a couple that even have it with clothalidone. Yeah, clothalidone is you know, in combo with atenolol, or oh, yeah. other hated <laughs> <laughs> antihypertensives. They just messed it up. They should have comboed HCTZ and atenolol. Yeah, it's for sure. And then you can have the world's worst drug <laughs> food for thought um potassium sparing diuretics think of them really as is what they sound like they're there to kind of maintain potassium levels when you use that in combination with a thiazide or like a loop diuretic or something they're not really going to provide any additional um, antihypertensive effect you're it's there just to kind of maintain the potassium so don't count on adding those and getting a lot more benefit with 
in regards to the pure blood pressure lowering ability. Um, we still want to uh, we want to avoid these in patients that have a creatinine clearance less than thirty uh, because they spare that potassium wasting. Uh, you risk of hyperkalemia, especially if you have a patient who's taking an ACE or ARB or they're on maybe potassium chloride supplementation or whatever, um, that can uh, become a risk factor for hyperkalemia at that point. So you do have to kind of monitor that. Um, but again, we have better options um, like in Dapamide. We don't have to worry about the potassium wasting as much. Mm-hmm. So I try to stay away from these if, if at all possible. Yeah. But then we have another one of our big hitters, the commonly prescribed uh, meds and first-line options, which are calcium channel blockers, specifically the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Um, The most popular by far is amlodipine, uh, but there's also philodipine and nicardipine and nifedipine. Um, But amlodipine is cheap and probably going to be what you see in in most cases. Um, There are some drug interactions, specifically a very common one that you'll see is with simvastatin. Um, so if you're using simvastatin with amlodipine, you don't want to use more than 20 milligrams of simvastatin. Um, it can also, um, levels may be affected by fluconazole. So if there's a yeast infection and somebody's on amlodipine, um, something to, to consider. Um, but calcium channel blockers um, cause contraction of cardiac and smooth muscle cells, um, requires an increase in free intracellular calcium concentrations from the extracellular fluid. Um, they stop the influx of calcium across cell membranes. They block L-type, cal- L-type calcium channels, and they lead to coronary and peripheral vasodilation. That's how they have their blood pressure lowering effect. Um, definitely some adverse effects uh, to be aware of. No cough, uh, but they can cause peripheral edema. Is uh, not an uncommon complaint with these. Um, also, of course, uh, hypotension, potential dizziness. Um, and something we mentioned before, uh, but is definitely a, a good clinical pearl, is um, this edema from the amlodipine or calcium channel blockers uh, cannot be um, controlled with a loop diuretic. It won't be effective. Um, you have to use something that's going to dilate the um, efferent kind of arterioles, I guess you can think of it, in the capillary beds to 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 reduce the peripheral edema. So, yeah, so you with the calcium channel blockers, you're getting this pre-capillary arterial side um, that it's dilating, so you get an in- increased blood flow into the capillaries, the capillaries swell, and that's what's actually causing the edema. So when we give something like an ACE or ARB, we're then dilating the post-capillary or the venous side, and that is what's going to kind of a- reduce or relieve that inner capillary pressure and then allow the peripheral edema to go away. If you if you give a loop diuretic, it's just going to help them. You know, they're going to diurese the patient, but you're not. It's not a fluid retention problem that's causing the, the edema in that case. So, don't give a loop diuretic. Give ACE or ARB. It's an important thing that a lot of people end up missing. Right, and it's commonly it will commonly be on a loop, yeah. and they're not getting relief, and they're just getting diuresed. And, Probably too much. Exactly, and and kind of on that same um, idea, uh, one kind of clinical question that'll come up often uh, often asked students and whatnot is if you have a patient who, let's say they have diabetes or CKD, and they, you get their microalbumin re, um, or uh, albumin creatinine ratio, and it's elevated, showing that they have some proteinuria present, and they're only on amlodipine. You know, you're not going to get any kind of like drug interaction, you know, flag or anything like that. But mechanistically, if we think about the glomerulus and the afferent arterial going into the glomerulus and the efferent um, going out, if on the same concept as the capillary bed, you're going to dilate the uh, blood flow going into the glomerulus or the afferent arterial and not the efferent side. So you're going to increase the blood flow going in, which is going to increase the inner glomerular pressure, which then can increase or worsen proteinuria. And uh, we have to give an ACE or ARB to dilate the um, efferent arterial on the other side, which is then going to reduce that inner glomerular pressure and reduce that risk of proteinuria. So if you do have a patient that has an increased uh, albumin creatinine ratio uh, and they're only on amlodipine, please put them on an ACE or ARB and fix the situation if possible. Yeah, that um, the loop slash ACE um, clinical pearl I, I gave to one of my physician friends a few years ago. And I've heard him say multiple times that it's his favorite clinical pearl to throw at other clinicians because they're always like, what? And then they do it and it works great. Yeah. Because it, um, I guess it's just little known. So spread the word. Yep, yep. Um, so as far as the efficacy of calcium channel blockers, there was uh, a large trial that compared it to some other standards of care, like, um, there's amlodipine versus lisinopril versus glorthaldone versus doxazosin in the all hat trial, which Mike referenced before. Um, 
Um, just as you would expect, Oxazosin did not do well, faring up against the other three. It was stopped early due to an increased risk of um, of a heart failure compared to chlorthalidone. But they were primarily looking at um, fatal coronary artery disease or non-fatal MI, um, and uh, different than doxazosin, they saw no difference between the other three. Um, and amlodipine was actually superior to the ACE to lisinopril for blood pressure control in African Americans um, and a reduction in stroke uh, in women. So that's part of the reason why um, uh, calcium channel blockers and uh, thiazide diuretics would be considered first line over ACEs in African American patients. But really, that's one of the main studies that people quote when they talk about, you know, in, in the majority of patients, when you're starting an agent, you can kind of pick ACE or ARB, or you can pick a thiazide or thiazide like, or a calcium channel blocker, because um, in most patient populations, it's going to be kind of equal outcomes regardless of what you pick. Yeah, and, and that's why those are kind of the first three that we consider, and we knock doxazosin down the line. The only one missing would be a beta blocker to have been knocked down the line to, yeah. Uh, yeah, to consider those the, the top three or four. So those are our dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. We also have our non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, which would be our diltiazem and verapamil, which come in various formulations of sustained release and extended release, um, and different brand names, capsules, tablets, all that good stuff. So these are going to work by primarily decreasing the heart rate and slowing the um, atrioventricular nodule conduction. So these are working more to reduce the heart rate and cardiac output versus working to reduce the um, total peripheral resistance like the dihydrocalcium channel blockers do. Um, so these are going to have a little bit different adverse effects. You're going to have to worry more so about... Um, Things like constipation, um, specifically verapamil has a higher um, case of that, and also can cause some cardiac conduction abnormalities, especially at higher doses, um, can cause some other GI upset like nausea, um, some peripheral edema possibly, but um, you know these are agents that we typically are going to be saving more so for patients that have like AFib or other things that we need to control the heart rate for. Um, one area that I will say we can kind of utilize these in hypertension is if, if you have a patient who has proteinuria and they really would need to be on a ACE or ARB, um, but for whatever reason, maybe have a contraindication to that, um, they could be put on a non dihydrocalcium channel blocker because that's going to dilate the afferent and the efferent arterial and the nephron, and that's going to decrease that uh, intraglomerular pressure and reduce mm -hmm. the proteinuria. So that's one area I do kind of kind of save these for is if, if I'm not treating something that has to do with the actual heart rate um, and I need an ACR but I can't use those, then I can go with this to decrease and protect the, the kidneys. Right. Um, then there's aldosterone antagonists, which you'll recognize from, um, you know, your heart failure lectures. Uh, but there's a plerinone and the more commonly used spironolactone. Uh, spironolactone also comes in combo with HCTZ. Want, want, but the idea is probably um, spironolactone increases potassium, kind of has a potassium sparing uh, effect. Uh, so they might use that to kind of balance out the potassium loss by HCTZ. Um, so they compete with aldosterone for receptor sites in the distal renal tubules. They also increase sodium, uh, chloride, and water excretion. Um, but like I said, potassium sparing effects. So decrease as far as electrolytes go, they're going to decrease sodium and chloride increase potassium. Um, they may also block the effect of aldosterone on um, arteriolar smooth muscle as well. So that's another way they have an effect. They do have renal dose adjustments, um, um, just, just starting at 50 mLs per minute of uh, creatinine clearance. Um, so you'd want to kind of cut the dose in half almost um, with a creatinine clearance of 30 to 49. And they are contraindicated with a creatinine clearance less than 30. Uh, but they would probably be considered uh, a fourth line option um, if there's other contraindications to the ACE, the ARB, the I guess um, fifth line if you consider ACE and ARB two different two different lines of a calcium channel blocker, thiazide diuretic, and then this is probably where you'd go um, depending on the patient's comorbidities before hitting a beta blocker uh, and then a, a maybe I don't know doxazosin or something like that if you need something way down the line. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they can decrease blood pressure significantly. They don't have necessarily the, um, outcome data of decreasing cardiovascular events that some of these other ones do. Um, but you can see a decrease of, um, 20 millimeters per mercury systolic with the aldosterone antagonists. 
And and really, the way I personally think about it is, I'm going to try to optimize, get them on an ACE or ARB, one of the two. I pick pick one of the two, and then a thiazide or thiazide like, and then a calcium channel blocker. Once I have them established on those three classes, those is the is the you know triple combo that we want to use as first or some line. some contraindication of one of those. Yeah, or if they can't be on one of those and have a contraindication, then the next one in line, if they meet the criteria, would be an aldosterone antagonist. Um, so either spironolactone or a plerinone. Um, the other thing we didn't mention is the potassium. Um, maybe you I did. didn't mention the number, no. If, um, if potassium is over five, then we can't start spironolactone. So whereas we get some more leeway with the ACE or ARB, we can go up to 5.5. This one's 5.0. You can't use any, you can't use this one. Um, and we'll look at a comparative trial looking at different fourth line uh, mm-hmm. agent op- options and kind of see why we like spironolactone. But uh, let's go through a couple of the beta blockers too. Um, so when we think of beta blockers, we typically think of our cardio selective and non selective. Um, so some examples of cardio selective would be like a tenolol, pisoprolol, or the metoprolols, um, non selective being like propranolol or natalol. We also have our mixed alpha beta blockers, which is our carvedilol and labetalol. And then we have our cardio-selective vasodilatory uh, beta blocker, which is our nabivalol, or brand name bistolic. Now, with these, we, we typically try to stay away from beta blockers when we're dealing with primary hypertension. Now, if the patient has, you know, reduced ejection fraction heart failure, they have um, coronary artery disease or ischemic heart disease, they have um, a history of MI or some kind of other uh, acute coronary syndrome, you know, th- then we want to move them up closer to the front of the line. But if just primary hypertension, you're being treated with with a, you know various agents, beta blockers are going to be much further down the, the line. And you um, can go back to guidelines from this um, millennium that would put them right up there with the, you know, the other first line options, which shows you how much things can change in 15, 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. And if we remember back to that that blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance equation, you know, they will decrease the blood pressure initially. So you'll get a decrease in heart rate, which brings your cardiac output down. Uh, And so, you know, you'll get an initial decrease in blood pressure. However, over time, you know, you're blocking the beta receptors, but the androgenic nervous system is still active. And so your norepinephrine is still going to be binding somewhere. And so your alpha receptors are then going to have kind of unopposed activity. And when you get um, activity of the alpha receptors, especially in the periphery, that's going to lead to an increase in um, vasoconstriction um, in the periphery is going to increase your total peripheral resistance. And so that's going up while cardiac output is going down. And it basically is a, creates like this sort of wash as far as the, the end result of blood pressure lowering. So you're not really going to get the same blood pressure lowering effect if you're using a plain beta blocker, even if it's cardio selective. Now, if you are going to use a beta blocker in primary hypertension, the guidelines say to use either labetalol or carvedilol because they are the alpha beta blockers. So you're blocking the beta receptors to decrease cardiac output, and you're decreasing the alpha receptors in the periphery to decrease total peripheral resistance and altogether lowering blood pressure. They also say you can use the nabivalol because um, you're getting the beta blockade and you're also getting um, nitric oxide production, which is then going to cause the vasodilation as well. Mm-hmm. So labetalol, carvedilol, and nabivalol are the only three beta blockers that we should be using in primary hypertension without a other, you know, an additional comorbidity that would indicate beta blocker you know, being important. And like how often do you see any of those except for carvedilol? Right. Not too often. Yeah, right? not too often. So, And what about a tenolol, Cole? Atenolol belongs in the where? In the trash can. In the trash can. So atenolol is uh, one of our least favorite drugs if you've been following our podcast. Um, one of the reasons for that is there was a meta-analysis that was put out in Lancet back in 2004 that looked at atenolol versus placebo when it comes to like overall outcomes. And what they found is that there was basically no difference between atenolol and placebo when it came to all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, MI or stroke. And then when you compared atenolol versus other antihypertensives, um, the all-cause mortality was higher in the atenolol group. So the number needed to harm was 111. So basically for every patient that you put on atenolol as opposed to another agent, you increase the risk of uh, mortality in that patient for every 111 patients. Um, so yeah, atenolol, garbage. Couldn't be a placebo. How It, it almost can't even call itself a drug. 
That's yeah. like a supplement. It's like a poison. <laughs> it's like a poison. <laughs> it's basically a poison. So if you're going to prescribe a tenol, you're prescribing poison. You're prescribing poison. <laughs> and you heard it here. <laughs> it's on the fast mover uh, shelf at a lot of pharmacies. So there's a lot of people. It sure is. That we were accusing of poisoning people. Poisoning people. It's not what we're saying. Yeah. Well. Is it? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so there's also kind of a last line class um, that you will see uh, of alpha blockers. So, you know, we talked about carvedilol, labetalol, mundabivalol being the alpha beta blockers, or I guess carvedilol and labetalol. So these are just alpha blockers. Um, so we talked about doxazosin before with that all hat trial. There's also prazosin um, and terazosin. Uh, so uh, we mentioned the all hat trial, significant increased risk in heart failure with doxazosin versus the others. Um, not a great option. But when will you see it used? Uh, you'll probably see it used in patients who have blood pressure and hypertension. Is that a good idea? Probably not. So the American Urologic Society now recommends not using doxazosin in this situation. They say, you know, even though in a lot of situations, it's nice for us to say kill two birds with one stone, use, you know, something if you're hitting depression plus sleep or something like that. Um, but in this instance, they say treat them separately. Don't use doxazosin just because of how poorly it works um, and what poor data we have in hypertension. So don't use it. Uh, but how do they work? Um, they inhibit the uptake of catecholamines in the smooth muscles uh, that are found in the peripheral vasculature, um, and they do lower the blood pressure some. They um, can actually lower the blood pressure significantly um, with patients who are newly starting on it. So they, they call that the first dose phenomenon. Um, you might get dizziness, faintness, even palpitations, um, or a patient might pass out a couple hours after the first dose that they have. Um, they can also have orthostatic hypertension over time. So in the elderly, this is not um, a great option. Um, they have various adverse effects. They do cross the blood-brain barrier, so they can cause vivid dreams, uh, depression, um, even priapism. Uh, but you, you will see prazosin used uh, for a different indication um, of uh, nightmares associated with PTSD, uh, which the effectiveness of that is a whole different podcast. Uh, but that's another, another place that you'll see that used. So kind of going back to my original question of like, what should we use fourth line if we've optimized our first three, um, you know, options? Um, there was a study called Pathway 2 that looked at um, patients with resistant hypertension who needed a fourth line agent um, who were optimized on ACE or ARB, calcium channel blocker, and uh, thiazide. And they compared the fourth line agents of either aldosterone antagonists, they used spironolactone, versus bisoprolol, versus doxazosin. And basically what they found is spironolactone was the better option compared to those other two. So I always try to consider spironolactone my fourth line option. And then if that's not an if that's you know contraindicated in that particular patient or they can't tolerate it, or whatever the case may be, um, then I would do go to a alpha beta blocker like carvedilol or labetalol, um, and that would be kind of how I rank my my medications that I would use. So the first three like first three classes like what you talked about earlier, then spironolactone, then carvedilol, labetalol fifth line and then sixth line if you still needed something and, and you've assessed whether or not they're actually taking the medication and all that good stuff then you could potentially go with one of those other garbage you know alpha blockers or whatnot um, we also have like our central alpha 2 agonists like clonidine um, or methyl dopa um, methyl dopa is a is a good option in pregnancy for hypertension um, however in like otherwise you know healthy you know patients that you're just treating with hypertension um, really clonidine and methyl dopa aren't very great options you're going to get um, some potential for um, like rebound hypertension if you have an abrupt discontinuation um, they're just not nearly as uh, as effective as some of the other agents they don't have that outcome data associated with them and so uh, you know maybe clonidine in the setting of like a you know patients in the clinic and you need to lower their blood pressure you know abruptly mm -hmm. but even then, there's a study that compared amlodipine to clonidine and it seemed to be better even in that particular sense so and you will see clonidine used in kids uh, with behavioral disorders um, which is interesting, but um, I guess of note with those kids, sometimes they will be, I, in my opinion, I guess sometimes they're um, overdosed, not necessarily by prescription, but I think that they'll just be given a lot of it um, because, you know, parents are trying to get their kids to calm down and that sort of thing, but it can have adverse effects of rebound hypertension, lowering the blood pressure too much, um, so it can be dangerous, so just a good, good little counseling point to patients who have kids on that. Yeah. Um, the last class we'll talk about is the direct vasodilators. We have uh, mendoxendil and then hydralazine. 
Um, so basically the hydralazine is, is something that, again, we're going to kind of save for um, like sixth or seventh line option. Um, it can cause peripheral edema. It can cause heart palpitations. It can cause this reflex tachycardia. Um, and then uh, midoxanil is really going to be used best if it's given topically for um, – patients who are having male pattern baldness um that's really what you scratching your head while you're talking yeah, about I know, that. i'm thinking about it um so that's really where you're going to see the most benefit with that particular drug um it's can cause severe hypotension um acutely um and even can lead to a pericardial effusion in some cases and it of, oftentimes it's given with a beta blocker in a loop like if you're going to do it like inpatient or something like that but uh, not a great option outpatient wise and uh can be potentially a problem i feel like where i see hydralazine dosed multiple times a day but usually usually for something like angina or somebody who has heart failure or something like that yeah there is the combo with um, isosorbide dinitrate um, in heart failure patients but even that is kind of further down the line as far as recommended and it's only got data in african-american patients right so something that uh you know the guidelines say to basically reserve for the last uh last line of defense if you need something yep that's alpha agonist and direct vasodilators yep um we also have loop diuretics not necessarily recommended for just like mike said treatment of primary hypertension where you'll see these used of course is in heart failure with patients who need um symptomatic benefit from their edema uh, but they, uh, different than the um, thiazide diuretics, will inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and chloride in the ascending loop of Henle, leading to increased excretion of water, sodium, chloride, magnesium, and calcium. So decrease in a lot of electrolytes. Um, so really only effective for diuresis, not even mortality benefit in heart failure, but our standard of care for symptoms. Um, they can, uh, because of a sulfur moiety, they can affect um, patients with sulfur allergies. Um, so using caution with a patient who has a severe sulfur allergy. Um, the loop diuretics we're familiar with are bumetanide, torsamide, and furosemide. There is one more called ethacrinic acid, the little known loop diuretic, that does not have a sulfur moiety. So for a patient who has a severe sulfur allergy, um, and who really needs a loop diuretic, maybe for heart failure reasons, uh, ethacrinic acid would be your, um, your treatment of choice there. And one thing I do want to bring up kind of in closing is an argument I hear as far as picking a blood pressure medication uh, or medications is as long as the blood pressure is lower, then who cares what agent you use? Um, so, and you've probably heard us talk about this in the podcast before, but the accomplished trial, I think, is my the best example of why that's not necessarily the case. So, if you're not familiar with accomplished, it was benazepril and HCTZ versus benazepril and amlodipine. At the end of the study, um, and which was stopped early, um, the blood pressure, you know, results, the blood pressure that was calculated was an average of 131 systolic in the benazepril HCTZ group and 132 in the benazepril amlodipine group. So great. You know, we didn't see a difference in, in uh, blood pressure. So theoretically, based on that initial um, theory, we shouldn't be able to, uh, we should be able to just pick either option and be good with it. Problem is when we look at the actual outcomes, the primary composite, for example, which was cardiovascular death um, or death from cardiovascular causes, uh, it was significantly decreased that risk with amlodipine um, and benazepril versus the HTTZ combo with the number needed to treat of 45. Um, some other things that were different were fatal and non-fatal MI uh, with the number needed to treat of 167. Um, a uh, revascularization procedure was significantly decreased it, with the number needed to treat of 111. Um, composite of cardiovascular events um, was decreased with the number needed to treat of 58. Uh, so um, primary outcome plus hospitalization due to heart failure was number needed to treat of um, 48. And so it's all in favor of the amlodipine benazepril combo. So that's a great example of it's not just a matter of lowering the blood pressure here and now, but also protecting the patient because of how we lower the blood pressure. So the mechanism in which we lower it is important. Same thing, you know, we saw that with atenolol. You know, you can lower the blood pressure with atenolol, but then when you look at the outcomes in that meta-analysis, you don't see the same results as you do with other antihypertensives. So it is, it is important to figure out which agents we're using and not just trying to lower the blood pressure to a certain goal. Treat the outcomes, not the, the numbers. Don't just treat the numbers. Numbers are great, but they're just a guide. Numbers are great. 
said the pharmacists. We do like numbers, right? We do like numbers, but we also like the patients to live. So. We do like that. And speaking of that, I did want to mention one other situation that I referenced at the top. Um, but uh, as far as uh, the dippers and the non-dippers, the patients whose blood pressure remains elevated while they're sleeping, um, one trial that looked at that, probably the, the primary trial that looked at that, um, as far as just dosing one of their blood pressure medicines at bedtime versus dosing all of them in the morning, uh, was the MAPEC trial, M-A-P-E-C. And uh, they did see that dosing one blood pressure medicine at night was more effective in reducing mortality and cardiovascular events than dosing them all in the morning with improved blood pressure control and decreased uh, the non-dipper phenomenon. And it, it was kind of irrespective of which blood pressure medicine it was. Um, there's also the HYGIA trial, H-Y-G-I-A, don't know if that's how you say it, um, looking at bedtime dosing of ACEs or ARBs. Um, it did see a larger benefit um, in cardiovascular events with dosing one of those at bedtime. Um, so that's an, an interesting option to do if you're going to do one. And, uh, you know, doing lisinopril twice a day would kind of take care of that situation. And, and with Hygieia, there was some discrepancy as far as how they reported their data and whatnot. I don't think it was actually redacted, but it, there was some concern about the way, the authenticity of the way they promoted their data. But it does make sense why if, if ACEs and ARBs did, were, were seen to have a better um, or a larger benefit at bedtime dosing compared to other agents in that trial, it does make sense because the RAS system is more active at right. night. So And yeah, looking at their looking at their results, they're kind of insanely good. <laughs> it's too good yeah. to be true. I didn't list them off for that reason. Yeah. But I mean, it, it makes sense. And so that's you know a reasonable thing to consider. So when you're going through those first line agents and you have ACE or ARB, thiazide, and then a calcium channel blocker, before going to a fourth line agent, make sure that you have either split the dose of the ACE or ARB if it's a shorter half-life, you have moved the ACE or ARB to nighttime dosing if you want to only do it once a day, and then if you have a patient on HCTZ, switch them to clothalidone or endapamide. Um, do all those things first to optimize those first initial three medications, and then go to aldosterone antagonist if possible, um, and then if, from there, carvedilol, labetalol or nabivalol is our beta alpha beta blockers of choice and then six line just pick any of the remaining trash that's left over and go from there pick your poison pick your i po had somebody ask me the other day i used the phrase clinical pearl and they just they're like what is a clinical pearl it's not a medical person and i was like uh it's, i don't really know how to define it i guess it's just you know a, a nice tips. little little tip sorry it's a medical tip we just listed like seven clinical mike just listed and set like six of them Within 10 seconds. Rapid fire. That is the definition of a clunker pearl. We it's had like a bunch of them. It's incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Something like that. Um, anything else with this? I mean, we could keep going forever, but... Yeah, we, we hit all the good stuff. Like I said, top to bottom, hypertension treatment. We do have uh, our lectures available. Um, there are, you know, the lectures that I do for my PA students um, available on Patreon. So if you are... Wanting a much more in depth, I actually have hypertension split into a three lecture um, series. So, Oof. yeah, it's like three hours or more, maybe four hours of hypertension. So, if you want a much more in depth um, version of that, check out our Patreon. I'm going to patreon.com slash core consult rx. Check that out. It's like three bucks a month to join, and you can download all the stuff and then cancel after a month if you really want to. You can have like access to 80 something lectures, I think it is up to now. But if, uh, you know, if you guys are members of freece.com, make sure that you go to the website after listening to this and um, follow the link in the show notes. It'll take you directly to the part of the website where you can take the post uh, episode test and claim your credit for continuing education for this. Um, and even if you're a student or whatever and don't need the credit, I would still say go ahead and, you know, do that because then you can do the practice tech questions and see how well you do. Hopefully you get a hundred and you can put it on your refrigerator. But, um, you know, if you have any questions for us, uh, feel free to send us an email. You can reach out to us on any of the social media platforms. Um, and you know, if we love to hear suggestions or, you know, tidbits of information, if we missed anything, um, you can also, uh, contact us directly, um, via text, which will also be in the show notes. And, uh, if, you know, we love to hear from you guys. Um, and then, uh, we will continue to, to roll out more episodes, more accredited episodes are coming out as well. Um, so I hope you guys are enjoying those and, um, we will talk to you guys on the next episode. Thank you so much. Have a great one.